Thank you for joining us for, for Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. Today I'm joined with Mark Connolly, the author of Cover Up, One Man's Pursuit of the Truth Amid the Government Failure to End a Ponzi Scheme. Mark, I really want to appreciate you, let you know we appreciate you coming on the show. Glad to be here. Uh, you were the head of the securities department uh, at one point. Yeah, from 2002 until 2008 when I resigned my position. And uh, there was a, a major event, and, uh, which was the, uh, obviously the, the reason for this book, right. uh, cover-up. Um, nobody thinks of New Hampshire as a, you know, this, a place where there could be a cover-up. It's the live free or die state. Uh, you know, we have 400 state reps. You know, everything's got to be on the up and up. You know, we have a nice happy face here. But uh, this book tells a different story that uh, many people should be aware of, at least in New Hampshire. Sure. Um, and it seems, we were talking a little bit off camera, but it seems to me, personally, that there, the little things locally seem to mirror what's happening in Washington. And you said it before I said it, but I thought it. So right. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to sure. lay claim to that as well, because what happens locally, it, it, it just mirrors what's going on. And we're not too happy what's happening in Washington today. Uh, nobody's accountable to anything. Uh, it seems as though somebody else is at fault. And that's where the story begins with you. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit of how this all started? Yeah, and if I may, let me segue from what you just said, because I, I think it really sets the stage for my book or uh, the Ponzi scheme. If you go back in the last, let's say, 30 years, we've seen a couple of major um, trends in our country that's played out in New Hampshire. One is that we've seen a huge amount of money flow into uh, the way government operates, political campaigns. Uh, we've seen uh, a blowback in terms of, of regulation. And what happened is, if you go back to, let's say, uh, late 1990s, we saw the first um, effect of a deregula deregulatory environment. That was called long-term capital management. It was a hedge fund. It blew up. It almost brought the economy down. Almost the same year, uh, the Congress repealed what's called Glass-Steagall, which was, to that point, commercial banks and investment banks were separate. Mm -hmm. In 1999, the Congress put them together where commercial banks and investment banks could be one and the same. And then we went into the period of 2000 where we had um, uh, 2000, 2002, the stock market blew up and we had WorldCom, Tyco, HealthSouth, yep. all those corporate problems. And then we go into 1996, 97 in which the mortgage market blew up and we went through obviously what we're still experiencing. So. In the history of, let's say, the, the market, which is about 140 years old in terms of the way we understand the United States, we've never seen two rapid blow-ups that we did in the last decade. And it really, if you, and everybody knows this, the, and what we just went through almost blew up the whole world economy. So how does that play into my book? If you look at where we are now, where we spent all this money on uh, the bailouts, whether it's the auto industry, uh, the banks, where are we now? We passed We're a, in debt. <laughs> we passed a, beyond the, the financial implication of that, right. which, is, which is uncharted territory in terms of how the Federal Reserve has reacted. Mm -hmm. This is where we're at. Dodd-Frank, which was supposed to address the shortcomings of the mortgage market, all, that, that was passed some um, three years ago. I believe it was two and a half, three years ago. Only a third of it has been implemented. The derivatives market which is basically a bet on, on what you have a, a person takes a bet on one side and on the other side. That derivatives market is what led to, in, in large part, the blow up of these banks. That market today is larger today than it was back in 2007. The banks that we bailed out, Goldman Sachs, Bank America, Wells Fargo, uh, JP Morgan, those banks are bigger today than they were back in 2007. And in fact, the 12 largest banks in our country are as big as the entire GDP of this country per year. It's almost $16 trillion. And the, t the top 10 banks today are bigger in terms of the GDP of this country than they were back in 2007. And we still have not addressed some of the fundamental questions that led to 
the financial blow up in 2007 and 8 that we all know almost tanked the economy. So you go back to 2000, excuse me, 1999, we had a hedge fund blow up called long-term capital management. You had the things like Bernie Madoff. Yep. And all that played out in a two, into rapid successions of the stock market tanking, the job market imploding. And we have not as yet fundamentally addressed what's wrong in Washington. What is that and how does it play into the book? In my opinion, it's the amount of money and influence by lobbyists and special interests that still control the dialogue. In Washington today, some $3 billion is spent every year by over 10,000 lobbyists who have a direct impact on what happens or doesn't happen in terms of regulation. Almost 20% of all that lobbying money is spent on banking and insurance and those kind of industries. They very much are involved in the regulatory environment and giving money to candidates for office. And here's, here's both sides. A, both sides. Here's an interesting example. If you go back to 1978 till today, almost half of those senators who served in the Senate, either retired or not reelected, are, are lobbyists today. Right. And, and the law says they only have to spend two years out of, uh, at once they leave office, of not being a, a lobbyist. But like and they're more, influence peddling, obviously. But, but even, even when they leave office, they can immediately go in and they, they can s serve in a role that's not a lobbyist. They call a strategic advisor or that kind of thing. And that is part of the problem. Say we have a revolving door between lobbying and, and Washington. In fact, it's been well documented. There are people who serve in industry, who go into public service, and they're bonus by how high they go up in terms of their position in Washington. That is what's going on in terms of financial regulation today. In New Hampshire, I talk about how FRM happened. FRM is Financial Resources Mortgage Company. It was a, what's called a hard money lender. What that basically means is um, it's loans that banks won't do because of the risk level is perceived as too high. It's a normal part of the economy. Um, when FRM blew up in 2009, that was the second largest Ponzi scheme. Let me interrupt you right there for a second. So the money that's being lent, that's not going into the, anything to do with the securities department. It's just cash. They've got hard cash that they, they want to lend out with a certain type of risk tied to it. Yeah, I, was gonna, I, I assume we can get into why I wrote the book and why, as a director of securities regulation, I had something to do with why I'm writing a book about the mortgage industry. But basically, um, just to complete my thought, yeah. um, a year and a half before FRM, Financial Resource Mortgage Company, blew up, I mean, it shuttered itself, it was a Ponzi scheme. There was another Ponzi scheme that was called Noble Trust. In the parlance of finance, it was called a non-depository trust. Okay. Okay. That existed in Manchester. That was a Ponzi scheme of some 20 plus million dollars. This I write about was probably some, in terms of money lost, was probably some 35 million. So two Ponzi schemes. In two years, in our state, over $50 million, probably three to 500 people losing their money. Why did that happen? That gets to my dialogue about what is going on in terms of regula regulations and regulators who don't do their job. In the case of FRM, this was an entity that had been in business for some 20 years plus, had been regulated by the New Hampshire Banking Commission, and um, in, in 2009, November 9th, I believe, to get exact, I was, I was phone called by the then bank commissioner, Peter Hildreth, who told me that FRM had been shuttered and that it was a Ponzi scheme and that my agency was responsible. And I said to him, you know, Peter, I really don't know what you're talking about. Um, we don't regulate FRM. It's, it's, it's a mortgage operation. The banking department regulates banks and mortgage entities. Um, I was heading up an agency of some 11 individuals at that time, and literally the agency was shut down over a period of a week because the banking department of some almost 60 individuals shuttered all the people who lost their money and were looking for some answers to the, the Securities Bureau. And I said to the staff, look, just listen to them, hear their story. We don't have any, inf we don't have any records. We don't regulate these guys. And shortly thereafter, I kept on hearing how my agency was responsible for FRM. 
And, and I, was, I, I was approached by a member of the Attorney General's office who said, you know, FRM is, is real estate, commercial real estate. The state doesn't regulate commercial real estate. You know, so basically the state wasn't involved, so maybe the banking department will take some responsibility. Your agency will take some responsibility, and we'll take responsibility, but ultimately nobody's responsible. And I said, I'm not playing that game. And shortly thereafter, um, I said, okay, if the banking department believes this is a securities matter, I want to see the records because I don't have any records. <laughs> if, if, I, if I'm being asked to take right. responsibility in my agency and therefore be able to answer questions that people have lost all this money, then I need records. So I asked for the records from um, the banking department, and they wouldn't give us the records. So I, I issued a subpoena. And actually, the funny thing about it was, I get into the book, uh, when, I, when I was writing the subpoena with some attorneys in my office, a member of the attorney general's office told those attorneys in my office that they were involved in issuing a subpoena. They could be uh, um, disciplined. And they were told that they had a dual responsibility to me as a director of securities regulation in their office because they were attorneys. So what's the cover-up? To answer the question you're anticipating you're going to ask me. The cover-up is this. <laughs> Yes, uh, okay. The cover-up is, in, in the terms of, of FRM, was this thing was shuttered, FRM. It wasn't shut down by the state. It imploded. Um, and the government, through the Attorney General's office, decided to conduct its own investigation of FRM, didn't talk to my agency, and then decided that it was going to blame my agency for, the Securities Bureau, for FRM, even though, um, it, and it put out a report of that. So the first part of the cover-up, which I talk about in the book, is it happened and how the government responded. But then it didn't respond. What the report didn't say to the legislature is that some 20, 25, 30, we don't know, complaints rolled through state government over a period of about a decade that either went to the attorney general's office or went to the banking department. Shouldn't it have gone directly to the banking department first? What we found out when the records were, some, some of the records were released, and mostly through the press, was uh, people wrote to the bank department, and in some cases, there were individuals who claimed criminal fraud was going on at FRM. And the person who wrote the report for the Attorney General's office on FRM, he headed up the department that criminal complaints were made about FRM, and his department forwarded those complaints to the banking department. So what am I saying? That all of the, what we know now, in terms of the cover-up, is the government said, through the Attorney General's office, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to conduct its investigation. Didn't bring in an independent entity, did it on its own. And it, it didn't tell the readers of their report that they had received all of these criminal and civil complaints about FRM and then shuttered them onto the banking department. And the banking department, when they saw the criminal complaints, they're a civil agency. They can't take criminal jurisdiction, so they sent them back to the Attorney General's office. That's exactly what happened. So that Can was the I first ask you part the name of the cover-up. Real quick, I'm, who was the head of the attorney general's office at the time? Uh, when when the original complaints started coming in, do you mind mentioning that? Kelly Ayotte was oh. the attorney general. She set up a, um, a a mortgage fraud unit, I believe, in two thousand eight, and around that time, criminal complaints were being filed in the attorney general's office in FRM. Did they respond? properly at the time, or did they just? I can't answer that. Okay. If you talk to the victims, it was a black hole. Complaints went in and no answers came out. And then some went to the banking department. Yes. And, and, the, and who was the head of the banking department? Peter Hildreth. Peter Hildreth. And again? How many complaints came into my office? None. <laughs> and why would they? Because it wasn't, it, it not only, you know, what was going on was this. So the press picks this up. And, you know, and it's, it's part of what makes people angry about government, that nobody takes responsibility. And I understand that. But the thing is, if somebody says that the government screwed up, let's figure out why and how. And that's, that's part of the next part of the cover-up, and we get into, if you want, yeah. in terms of how the government has responded or not responded since FRM blew up. Well, that is my, my question, because as I told you off camera, I, I sat on the redress committee. 
and it was the, it was there to a lot let the people petition their government for the errors or the, the wrongs that they suffered from the government. Right. And hopefully, some, holding somebody accountable, and then to the end that they be made whole. From what I understand, nobody's been made whole. As a matter of fact, not only did the victims find that black hole, they also got sued on top of the black hole, which which just staggers my mind. In that they complained, they they offered some money, to or they they invested some money. They found out that they were getting ripped off. They filed the complaint. Nobody did anything about it, and went this way, like you said. And then, instead of going into receivership, it went into bankruptcy, and an attorney sued them for making the loan. And I'm just a simple guy, but I'm outraged and I'm surprised that you know something bad hasn't happened as a result of this, this incompetence or this bullying or whatever happened. So take me to past this point. OK, I will. But let me go back to what you just said. It's, this is like Alice through the looking glass. There are so many different facets of this. Um, one of the things I do cover in the book is what you just talked about. Noble Trust, the second largest Ponzi scheme in New Hampshire history, which happened only a year or so before this. And, and that's, that's a wake up call. We have two major Ponzi schemes happening. And my point is they're happening for a reason, the same reasons that we have the problems in Washington. OK. When, when Noble Trust was was discovered as a Ponzi scheme, the state put this in receivership through the banking department. This is another entity regulated by the banking department. And what that means in, in plain terms is it slowly liquidated it. Monies could be found. It didn't, it didn't create an adversarial relationship with the people who were involved. In terms of FRM, the Attorney General's office and the banking department put FRM into Chapter 7, federal bankruptcy. That necessarily starts the clock ticking in terms of hiring a bankruptcy trustee. And the trustee's goal is to get as much money back as possible. And then result of that, people were sued. What's not talked about in terms of FRM is how the Attorney General's office, not only in terms of didn't respond to all the complaints it had for all these years about FRM, but then took a different tact about how they handled the bankruptcy process and not, not doing a receivership. And in my opinion, it was to get it out of the government, put it in the, in the federal courts, and then it created an adversary relationship. So a lot of these people who lost their money, their life savings, and, and you've met with them, I guess, these are simple people. They're not rich people. Um, and many of these people have suffered in ways that are just um, unconscionable. We've been suicides. They've been Yep. divorces. These are not rich people. They were, after finding out they've lost all their money, and it wasn't an investment, it was a loan, when they figure out they've lost their money, then they're getting sued for more money. And, and obviously, these people are saying to themselves, why? I don't even have any money to go hire an attorney to defend myself. It cascaded into, I think, what is a huge black mark on our state in terms of how this happened. And to your point, Getting beyond this, not only did the government portray this in a way, in my opinion, and I feel fairly confident in saying this, when the screw up happened and it was millions of dollars, the goal became not only to do this so I'm not have career risk, but also how to stop the liability from the state. 30, 40, 50 million dollars, how much? So I think it was apparent to me with my background in securities. The best way was to call it a security, because when you have a security and it goes to zero, it's out. But if you have, and I don't want to get complicated, but if you have a loan and there's any money left over, it's like having a collateral position. It was much easier to defend the state by calling it a security, because it wasn't a security and we didn't have any records. And to, to my point is, only a year ago, a federal bankruptcy court has ruled, in effect, it is not a security. It always was a loan. So where do we go from there? Mm. Since my resignation, which I resigned in May of 2009, saying it's a, it's a, it's a cover-up, I'm not going to be part of it, I want to call attention to this, my purpose was to call attention to the legislature and others to do something to address legislatively the reasons why this happened. And I can tell you, as somebody who's written this book and has followed this, nothing has happened 
to address the shortcomings. So it can happen again. It can, it's going to happen again. Let me give you an example, just one example that I talk about in my book. We all hear today that um, there's, there could be too much regulation. And actually, I agree with that in some respects. Um, let me give you an example of that. The banks have been basically buttressed up to be now really too big to fail. Right. If they were too big to fail back in 2006, six seven, they certainly are today. But if you, if you talk to a small, small banker, a community banker, they're going to tell you they had nothing to do with what caused the downturn in the credit markets in 2006 and 7. But as a result of that, they have much more regulation on them. That's part of what's going on. But in, in our state, in the real estate market, we now know that when the banking department went in and audited FRM every year for a period of years, they would ask for records. And the perpetrator of this fraud, Scott Farrer, would say, I don't have to give you those records because the state does not regulate commercial mortgages and my business is commercial mortgages. Now, it came out later that he was, in fact, probably half his business was residential mortgages, which the state does have regulatory authority. But they didn't even have the regulatory or the legal authority to ask to see the records. Um, so the point is that you would think that we could construct a law that would say, OK, if you're doing commercial mortgage lending, and you're a large bank, or you are capitalized at a certain point, OK, you won't be regular at all. But if you're going to take somebody like Scott Fair, who's now in federal prison, who we now know is operating a business that was a Ponzi scheme but had no capital to support his business, and, and the banking department knew that through their audits, he had no real capital, how come we can't shut him down? How come we can't have just a modicum of regulation in commercial mortgages? That hasn't happened. Has anybody tried to introduce some re legislation that would remedy that? Have you, have you spoken to, to legislators? I've, I've, I've testified several times to the Commerce, House Commerce Committee, to the Senate Commerce Committee. I've suggested that as a, as a remedy. I've suggested that um, one of the things that's come out is our consumer protection laws are so weak that when uh, complaints go into a, a civil complaint goes into an agency like, like the banking department and they don't take action, the person who wants to f take action under the consumer protection laws can't if that agency doesn't want to do that. That was changed over a decade ago by industry. They call it double jeopardy, meaning if the agency takes action, then the person who filed the consumer complaint shouldn't take action. Well, they didn't address the problem if the agency doesn't take action, what the individual can do. The point is the consumer protection laws by most people have looked at our, even the attorney general's office has said the consumer protection laws need to be worked on. Nothing has changed. Um, and, and quite frankly, one of the things I've pointed out uh, to people is when you're a state rep and you uh, deal with lobbyists and they testify before your committee or they tell you why they want you to vote on a certain bill, they have to wear an orange badge. Right. They have to register with the Secretary of State's office. As a former as department head, I say to people, you know, a lot of regulation and client representation takes place before the state agency. They don't have to go in and register. They don't have to show up with that orange badge. When the, when the rules are being written in terms of how regulations have to be implemented, it's a whole different game, and the lobbyists want that to be the shadow government. We have, last time I looked, over 250 registered lobbyists in our state. And just like Washington, we have a revolving door. The same thing is happening in Concord. So what's one of the most powerful lobbyists in our state? It's the banking lobby. Somebody mentioned the insurance company as, as well, but uh... it's the same. It's the same. Um, it, it's in a, a smaller level, of course, but the same is happening. So, will will we have um, a financial fraud of the magnitude of FRM and Noble Trust? The possibility exists because we're not addressing the root causes of what happened. And and who ultimately pays the bill for that? Is it the investors? Is it is it going to be the taxpayers? Uh, and are there people, how can the legislature make the, the people in, in the, like Hilliard or the banking department, how can they make them accountable? How, how can these guys, you know, we, I told you a little story about Mr. Mr. Frost, you know, and how that he was, they, they went into his house and they, they violated they, his documents. He had to prove himself innocent. Cost him $180,000 to prove himself innocent. Nobody went to jail for anything. He had to fork over $180,000 and, 
And the attorney general says, oh, oh, well, we made an, a, a, you know, a screw up. We misinterpreted the law. This guy's out, you know, uh, everything. Nobody's held accountable. Is anybody safe from our government? And, and, I, and I'm not, you know, a conspiracy guy, but I'm just kind of wondering, is everybody walking in jeopardy if they make the wrong step? Nobody in, the, in, in our government seems to be accountable to anything. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I think you and I probably have to be from different political persuasions. Um, and I, but I don't think in terms of the system as we know it, I, I think, you know, the, the, the bigger question is what do we do to change the overall arc? Mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's, it's really reining in the influence of money in politics. Right. For example, um, not to go off on a complete tangent, but we know now in 2010, the Supreme Court said, Citizens United case, that we're not going to, um, we're basically going to take off all the, uh, um, the McCain-Feingold restrictions on how monies are to be reported. Now we have, you look at our uh, governor's race here in 2012, some 24, 25 million was spent, probably 20 million of that was spent from out-of-state money, monies that we don't even know who gave the monies to. And this is what's going on nationally. And that's why, in order to really fundamentally get to the root cause of this and, and the corrupting influence of money, as I just mentioned in terms of what's going on in Washington, we need to rein in the money. So what do we have to do here in the state? Same thing with Washington. All this money coming in, going to political campaigns, we need now to say, if you bundle money as a lobbyist for for clients, we need to know who of these clients are giving the money. We need, we need more transparency. I think that's one of the first places to go, more transparency. Before the fact, before the election, not after. B before and after. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's the, it's, you can come in with a great idea about how to make regulation more effective. But when it gets before the legislature, and if you get these lobbyists who can give the legislators their particular way of looking at it, it's not getting done. It's, it's, it's not getting addressed. And, um, you know, I just gave a couple of examples, and there are others. For example, um, when, and this, is, this one gets people when I explain this to them. When the banking department was trying to assign blame, and we now know why it was trying to assign blame the way it was to, to, to um, mitigate its culpability, um, it, it basically would not give us any records. In other words, I had to subpoena records. Right. You would think, as a department head, I should be able to view other state agency records. And it took me to file a subpoena and then to have a negotiated settlement with the Attorney General's office to give my agency access to records. I kid you not. And then once I sent our auditors to look at the records, we were told they were messing the office up too much and they weren't going to be allowed back. And that was it. So the point I'm making is there is a law on the books today that says that the banking commissioner can withhold records of any of the entities it regulates. And in and, and my read of it, he can't, even, he can't even, he or she cannot even be ordered to release those records by who he or she reports to the governing council. That needs to be changed. You know, years ago, we had uh, several big you know, state banks. The whole industry has shifted. We have interstate banking. The, the, the amount of banks that the, the commission now regulates is a very small number. In fact, the mortgage business is probably is equal, if not bigger. The need for privacy that may have been necessary years ago is now gone. There should be no reason that a State Department head should be able to withhold unilaterally any state agency records that it chooses to. Who came up with that in the first place? I, the, the bank lobbyists. In my, in my read when I was there, it was, it was the, to really um, you know, our, our, our laws in certain respects, and this is a wake-up call, aren't as consumer friendly as people would have you to believe. You know, we, for many years we had predatory lending in our state. We've had, you know, a lot of examples where we had a wake-up call. There was too much political influence being put on the system. And I think for FRM to happen in the way it happened, and then as a result, of these two Ponzi schemes, to have no legislative response is, to me, an example of why the system is screwed up. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm, this, it's starting to add a lot of color to what I'm, my understanding to what's going on. 
you know, when I was a state rep, you know, lobbyists would approach me, but it, they didn't seem to have a whole lot of influence. It, it, with me, particularly, they would, they would talk to our committees, or they would be in a committee, we would see them. Uh, unless something was going behind closed doors, uh, it, it didn't seem so apparent to me. I, I saw the stickers. I, I, you know, in my mind, I, I'm already coming in with my prejudice, uh, lobbyists. I'm already, I am prejudiced against them because I thought they've had undue uh, power for, for years. They, they actually take away with all the millions of dollars that, that they have at their disposal uh, to take away from, you know, Joe Sixpack or, or, or mom and pop store. They, they only have one little voice. You know, they can come to their committee, but these guys, they're working the system. I get that. So I've already had a prejudice against them. But I never really felt their impact in, in our, my decision making, uh, maybe because I was in the, the redress committee. But as far as maybe in the Senate or in, in certain committees, I, I, I guess that would be something to address. Uh, I, I know that there were, there, there were all kinds of, uh, on some social issues, you know, they had a lot of money coming from California. I remember talking, you know, with the gay rights thing, the gay, gay marriage. They were, Lobbyists were coming in all the time. Uh, I didn't see how that pressured anybody, though. You know. Yeah, I, I guess um, I see your point. Being a legislator, I didn't feel that, and, and although I had an, an, an adverse. Uh, My uh, reaction to what you just said is, you got to look at it. it goes back to the Alice Looking Glass analogy. You see what you see, but you don't see what's actually going on on elsewhere. For example, I guess it, I tried, that's what I was trying to get at. I it's harder to it. lobby 400 state reps than it is 24 state senators. Mm -hmm. And if you look at um, Senate leadership or House leadership, not in every case, but in many cases, the, the people who run certain committees, look where, the, look where the money's coming in through donations for the campaigns. Um, and look at the lack of staff that state representatives have. And so they're very, they become very dependent on one side of view. And, uh, you know, I'm not, my book and my, uh, what I'm telling people is not that lobbying per se is wrong. I'm saying the rules have to be changed so we have more transparency mm -hmm. and that um, I think we, we can do better to rein it in. There's certain things we can do in the state and federal government. For example, um, some states have said that if you are a state rep or state senator and, and you, you're running a committee or whatever, you shouldn't be taking money from the interest you're, you're basically having jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's certain ways we can start reining in the influence instead of you know, going, maybe some people have advocated more of, of uh, campaign finance reform, which I actually believe when you look at the amount of money for earmarks and all the things in the farm bill we have in the United States or the transportation bill, or if you get down to this state, it probably makes better sense in the way the system is bought and sold for somewhat. This is what, this is the overarching issue, I think, of our time. How are we going to get the government back to the people that it's supposed to represent? Amen to that. It's becoming more and more distant, and I think a lot of it is because of the amount of special interest money that's, that's basically creating a rigged game. Oh, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of money out there that I, you know, we can't account for, and you know, that's just another, another topic, but it, it causes me a lot of anxiety. Somebody tells me, if you're gonna run for Senate here in New Hampshire, you gotta have a couple hundred grand. Well, who has a couple hundred grand? Well, that means you gotta get, a, you gotta get into some packs. You know, you've got to find the right people. That's hard to do. That's hard to, and then, are you getting proper local representation for your ward, for your, your district? I don't think so. There's, there's always money coming from, from another ward or another. It, it, it's necessary so that you can get elected, so that you can get your, your message out. When it comes out of state or out of the country, is, and I'm sure that's happening. <laughs> well, I, I think it is. Um, um, I, I think the challenge here is to uh, look at the system as it is and say, what even small steps can we take mm -hmm. to address it? And I think that's one of the reasons I, I've, been, I've done maybe um, 20 speaking engagements with the Chamber of Commerce, I mean, excuse me, of Rotaries. And 
and this is somewhat new information when I talk about these statistics, you know, and talk about, okay, how the system really works, you know, who gets appointed to jobs, to, to head state agencies, who's behind that. Too often, I don't want to get into names, but I found in my experience, some of these departments I'm dealing with, very close to industry. I mean, it's, the, it's, it's in many cases, in my opinion, too close. One of the arguments or criticism of the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, is a revolving door. Some of these guys go in, get what they call the ticket punch, go out and represent the industry. Um, all of that is insidious. Mm -hmm. and it has effect over time. Um, you asked a question earlier that I want to get to. Why do we need to address this, both in terms of the people who've lost their money, and what does it mean for us as a state? If you go back and traditionally and you look at New Hampshire relative to the other New England states when we've been in a recession, we've always come out much better. We always didn't go down as much and we came back quicker. That's not happening this time. We, we are, we're much slower in how we're coming back. We're a state that is at risk. We have one of the oldest populations demographically of any state in the country. We have a lot of retirees. We are, and I can tell you as a former state regul securities regulator, there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there, especially you know, people being targeted, the elderly. Mm -hmm. And so my, my message about FRM in terms of, and I can address what I think we could do for some of these people who've lost their money. My message of FRM is this. If we don't address what went on here, this could impact our economy. Because if you're starting a business and you're an entrepreneur and you have capital at risk, are you going to come to a state in which you feel the message of the day is regulatory light? And if you're a person who finds out that people are losing their money, two major, two biggest pawn schemes in two years, that does not reflect well in our state in terms of economic development. So to me, there's an economic development message here why we need to address it, not only in good government, but in terms of helping our economy. Right. If this doesn't get addressed over time, and we have the reputation of not being fair regulators, not creating an environment where capital is flowing freely and safely, it's going to hurt the future economic development of the state, in my opinion. There, there really are a lot of aspects to this, because you know, we did have the victims on, and they were being victimized again. We had. Uh, a couple of state representatives, uh, D Democrat and Republican, both uh, Kingage and uh, uh, Hip, uh, Rip, Holden. Rip Holden, yes. And they were deeply involved. Right, in, they were on the Commerce Committee. They, they understood. So they, they were, there was a, uh, that perspective. Uh, coming from my committee that, that I sat as a, as a state rep in, in, in looking at the, the government structure and the accountability, there's definitely the transparency, which is it's, it's a need. Right. It's, it's a must. And then there's the accountability, which they're just, they're, there's that big, huge black hole. When I, what I understood when I took away from some of these uh, interviews is that the, the, one of the main people that were responsible for at least uh, holding the FRM accountable uh, was being grilled in a hearing and decided to, to walk out and then and now come back and then gets a nice pension where all these people are getting hurt. He's not accountable. Nobody, nobody did anything to that. That, that irks me. I, I understand where, where you're coming from with this. And I, I just think the more you look into it, there's another onion. There's another set of people that are hurt. There's another part of the problem. There's another part of the cancer that needs to be dealt with. The accountability, the transparency, making people whole. There's got to be legislation that's got to be enacted to, to hold these people accountable and the transparency. Then there's the regulation part, you know, which has always been a taboo. You know, deregulation was supposed to be the good thing, but there is a need for this when it comes to consumer protection. I get that. I think there's more to the story as well. Well, there is more to the story. Um, to use your analogy of the onion, let me go back to the cover-up uh, theme. We know the Attorney General's office tried to portray this a certain way that really didn't even, beyond the, the finger point, it didn't even begin to address its involvement in FRM, the amount of complaints it received. We even found out later through the press that Robert Farah was involved in another company, did the same thing to that other company, and that people lost their money and sent letters to the Attorney General's office 
and it dealt with another area of regulation called post-secondary education. And then it, according to the press account, that that agency was told by the Attorney General's office to exert attorney-client privilege and release of any documents. We're talking about the same individual, Robert Farrow. To go back to what you just talked about, there is no accountability here. Can I just stop you right there, attorney-client privilege? The attorney-client privilege should be, can only, in my, I'm not an attorney, but my uh, experience, it's, it's enacted by the client, not by the attorney. Are you, are you saying that he was holding the attorney general? <laughs> what, no, what I'm saying is, you know, I'm getting back to the theme of cover-up, and, you know, cover-up in terms of how I define it is what I saw, which is what the book is about. I took notes when I was there about meetings I went to. That's what the book's about. Subsequent to my leaving state government in May of 2010, press accounts. So I, I'm just saying what I read in the press, mm -hmm. particularly New Hampshire Business Review, I believe the reporter was Bob Sanders, he wrote that, and I didn't know this at the time I was in state government, that there was another entity, um, which I can't recall the name of it, but that Scott Ferrer was involved, I believe as treasurer, as a finance person, basically took money out of that company, and that individuals, it was, uh, I think, a company dealing with education for becoming an RN. In other words, they, they give you, the, they teach you how to do the exams. When these people, when, when these young students lost their money, they wrote letters of complaint. They went back from the post-secondary education to the attorney general's office, et cetera, and that when the reporter went in, and, and I'm doing this obviously through my hearsay of what I read, mm -hmm. asked for the records, they were told by the post-secondary education that there was attorney-client privilege. Okay. So obviously, if you look at the facts, the government doesn't want the story to get out. To complete, and I want to go back to the accountability in a second, but to complete, to complete the story, these are the facts as we know them. Over 70 violations were recorded by the banking department over a period of 10 years. And some of these violations talked about um, inadequate capital of the company, talked about uh, privacy issues, people's records not being handled appropriately. We now know that uh, there was an attorney in the banking department who on two occasions drew up an order, shut the company down. It wasn't shut down, never went forward. So what's the other part of the cover-up I'm talking about? Yes, there have been inquiries, but there hasn't been an independent person who actually went in and put people under deposition under penalty of perjury to tell the truth. And there are people out there who really know more about the story that have not been put under the penalty of perjury to tell the truth. And the example you just used, where I wasn't there, I wasn't involved, but for the banking commissioner to be asked to resign his position. He didn't, he didn't do it. He wanted his day in court, so to speak, which in the state of New Hampshire's administrative hearing, he took six months, went to the hearing, blamed me, blamed the Securities Bureau, blamed other people, and when he got on the stand to tell his story, he spoke for something like five, seven, eight minutes, stopped, they called, it, they called a stop, he resigned and got his pension. Those are the facts. You can read into it, but if you're, if you're one of these victims that uh, witnessed that administrative hearing, to, to witness that um, is to me just exacerbating the pain these people feel. Right, and, and I think that's, I'm, I'm kind of feeling for them, uh, and it just, it, it drives you nuts because now what? Now what do we do? And then to get sued on top of that, the, the, the lenders, the victims, uh, it, it just adds, it, it just compounds it. You can't fathom. And all the while, they did their due diligence. Many of them did due diligence. Yep, they're licensed. They got Better Business Bureau. FRM had all the credentials that it needed with the licensing. Well, apparently, licensing doesn't mean jack in the state of New Hampshire if, if these people can get ripped off by, by this type of system. What I was told by many of the victims, several of the victims, is that they called up, did their due diligence, and they were told, you know, everything's fine. We don't have any complaints. We have one complaint. Um, obviously, they feel they weren't given the truth. And, and, and to me, that's scandalous. It's, it's, it's obvious that was it, uh, was it uh, regulatory inertia? Was it bureaucracy? Whatever it is, it's just wrong. Um, 
let me, let, me, let me go down a different path that we're not on, but I, I think it's, it's important to tell this part of the story. Uh, in 2011, thereabouts, I approached Senator Lou D'Alessandro of Manchester, and I explained to him that the agency that I oversaw for some eight years, we had a lot of significant fines. We went against uh, Tyco, we went against UBS, ING, Merrill Lynch. I would say over an eight year period, we probably, uh, between what they call restitution, monies to people and victimized, and monies actually to the government because there were penalties, probably told $50 million. Mm. And, you know, I'm gonna brag a little bit. We did, we, were, we got a national award for some of our actions, uh, as, as a national award in 2007 for, for what we did in terms of representing consumers. I went to him and said, do you realize, if anybody looked at what we did in that eight year time, I would say millions of dollars, I don't wanna give you an exact number, but several, several millions of dollars went into state um, accounts. This is not money that was budgeted. This is not part of the state budget. So I said to him, why can't we uh, establish a victim's fund? Some other states are doing it. So for example, if the state brings in $10 million over a period of years through banking, insurance, securities, whatever financial fraud, a portion of that will go into a, a victim's fund. Why should the government be in some way rewarded for other people's harm? When in fact, the government is responsible for its lack of oversight, but that's just my- But, but putting that aside- Right, right, right. It, it, there is some logic here. And when you, when you tell conservatives that, you say, why should the government benefit by other people's pain? They start seeing it. When you, when you say to people more liberal-minded, you can really explain it. The bill didn't go anywhere. So we brought it in again, and then it got morphed in. Instead of having a victim's fund, it became a FRM fund. And it, and it started all of the who's responsible, who did this, who did that, let's, let's relitigate FRM. So at the end of the day, the bill's going nowhere. And that, to me, is a shame. I don't see any reason why if our state brings in several millions of dollars that 5%, 10%, a small percent can't go into a fund mm -hmm. to at least, it's not to say who's responsible, who screwed up. It's that obviously um, the way the, the law works, if somebody commits a fraud, let me give you an example. Earlier in the year, the state, was a beneficiary of some $35 million through a, a national settlement with several large banks for mortgage fraud. I think a big portion of that money should have gone to uh, people who, who were grieved, people who were victimized. Now, some of the money did, but a lot of the money went to creating new jobs, task force. You know, it became a slush fund. It, it, the point is, even look at this money that's going into J.P. Morgan is signing a $13 billion settlement. Yeah. I would like some of this money to go to purposes that don't go towards just hiring new. I don't think the, the solution necessarily is hiring new regulators. I think it's getting the regulators to give them the tools and the laws to do their job. And go back to my original point, when you have, when I started this, when you have a literal economic meltdown that led into the most far-reaching, um, legislation that since the um, depression where the stock exchanges were basically set up uh, in the ways to rule the sale of investments in 1934, the most far reaching legislation, uh, the uh, Dodd-Frank bill, that it's only a third or thereabouts enacted and still some of the issues that they were dealing with back then, um, derivatives, uh, what they call default, credit default swaps, it was reported in the paper just the other day that part of Dodd-Frank is to say that if a bank is conducting credit default swaps, which, swaps, which is just bets, it's just right. taking bets to make money, they should be pushed out of the bank holding company and put in a separate subsidiary that doesn't have any, um, any, any, uh, any way to go to the government through the Federal Reserve to get money. The House of Representatives just in the past 10 days has passed a bill, no it stays in that bank holding company. Meaning the economy's coming back, the stock market's coming back, and this is the, this is the, um, the, it, this is the way it goes. And then when it goes next time, we're gonna all say, what happened here? Yeah, uh, 
I, you're the you're the economist, and I, I mean some of that definitely is definitely kind of going over my head. I'm, but I'm thinking of all this money that's being printed right now, and when they stop printing money, does the does the economy go? By the way, and I know that's a way off topic, but I'm thinking, is our economy on its rebound? Are we are we doing good? Are we, are we coming back? No, oh, well, we we are doing better, but we're in uncharted territory in terms of what you're talking about is. Um, the, the economic stimulus by the Fed. Yeah. It's never been, it's, it's, it was done once before, I believe, right around World War II and thereafter. I think it is, I, I think it played a, I think it, personally, I think it played a role for a certain period of time. Now I think it's, it's gone way too long, it needs to end. And part of the reason why I think the Federal Reserve has done this is because of the chaos that exists in Washington. They can't even get the physical house in order. We just went through the, almost the government shutdown. Um, should the Federal Reserve be putting so much liquidity in the system, I think it's dangerous. I, I would agree with that. Is somebody benefiting from that? One, one or two people benefiting? Who's benefiting from that? Somebody's got to be, they're printing the money. It's going somewhere. Somebody's getting 1% of it somehow. Different, you know, this is going out. I mean, I'm not going to. Like I said, I'm way off topic. Well, but, uh, but it's let's like, look at it this way. The stock market is hitting record highs. Um, a lot of that is because of liquidity in the system. And a lot, there's a lot of fear out in, in, uh, in, in, in the economic world This is going to lead to inflation. Um, I would agree that's very probable. Um, and, you know, that's a different, you know, in order to really have a good discussion about this, you need to get some economists in here. Right. But, but if you think about it, this, is, this, this goes right back to the, the, the original topic at hand. It's like everything is linked. We're having this, uh, we had, what, the government almost did a, a trillion dollars in the TARP program. We did bailout dollar for dollar on a lot of these banks. And putting aside whether it was right or wrong, and now we went through the sequester, we went sequester, and we went through the, um, the almost government shutdown. That's related because we put so much money to prop the economy, but the economy needed to be propped because we had insufficient regulation. Think about that. In other words, if the regulators were doing their job, give me an example. The Federal Reserve has the power, had the power, to put restrictions on all of these, like, no-doc loans, interest-only loans, principal building up loans. They didn't do it. The Congress had several bills before it in, uh, in the early part of the last decade to rein in that excess in the mortgage market. They didn't do it. Why? The lobbying influence. We set ourselves up for now the conundrum we're in, which is on any level where you fall philosophically on what's going on in terms of what the Federal, how the Federal Reserve is reacting, it's not a good place to be in. And the reason it's not a good place to be in is because if what I'm saying is true, where we went through the, um, the largest economic slowdown since the Depression in 2000, 2002, three years, the stock market was down. Three years, the economy really was down. Then we went through you know, what, what happened internationally in this country, where we put a lot of money in terms of defense. And then we had this credit blow up. Because we're not correcting the system, the next question becomes, putting the Federal Reserve aside and TARP, what happens when the next crisis hits? We're not going to have any money left to do anything. That's why this is dangerous, what's going on. And it's, it's, it's why we have to do something to correct the system, because ultimately, what we just went through and the lack of real job growth and the, um, the fact that we are losing our market share in a lot of key industries in the world, that's only going to exacerbate if we get into another financial crisis. And so one of the, this book, basically, Cover Up, talks about what happened here on a local basis. It's mirrored in, 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 our, in the grand scheme of things, in the, the mega world, if you will. I talk about, I actually do talk a lot about some of the things I'm, we're talking about tonight in the context of FRM is just a microcosm of the larger problem. Right. And this, you know, I know that there are a lot of state reps, they, they just don't get it, and I can see why. Because there are, it is the onion. There's a whole lot to understand. So they dismiss it as, oh, well, that, the FRM was just a bunch of rich people losing their money in a bad loan. Oh, my gosh. 
you have no idea what you're talking about, and so they don't deal with it. They need to be, they, they need to be educated. I know you're talking to the Rotary, but there needs to be a forum where, hey guys, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. We need certain regulations to protect the consumer, to protect the, the voter, to protect our, our infrastructure in government. You know, let me go back to something you just said, which is really important. FRM, we could spend five hours talking about it. And it comes to a point where people say, I don't want to talk about that anymore because we have other issues to deal with. And, and I get that. But maybe the, the, the real issue here is not trying to um, assess blame mm -hmm. or to find fault necessarily, although accountability is important. But take a small part of it and have the legislature focus on that small part. Let, let, me, give you, you. let me give you an example of that. We just talked about these people being victimized twice. So when a state agency makes a decision to put a company into receivership and then makes a different decision to put in a federal bankruptcy, I would think that would be a very good committee hearing, mm -hmm. at least to let the, in this case, the Attorney General's office know the legislature wants answers to this because even putting aside the responsibility, even trying to assign response, putting that whole issue aside, the fact is the state did, after the fact, make a decision to put this company in federal bankruptcy and created even more problems. So here's people. a set of guidelines uh, that, that we need to do. And I get that. I, I really get that this is helping focus on a solution. Right. And I'm, I'm looking at, obviously, too much information and trying to sort it at, at this point because I feel for the victims. I really do. I feel, and, and yet I want, account, I want our government to work better. I want it to be more open. But baby steps and, and, and really maybe spoon feed, you know, some solutions to, to what really has to happen. Uh, let me say something else too, uh, you know, because a lot of it is bad news we're talking about. <laughs> Let's is. start with some good news. I think um, oftentimes, and, I, and I, I think you'll agree with me, oftentimes politicians are behind the curve. Oftentimes, people are much more in front of what's needed to be done to change. And as an example, what I'm talking about is, um, I believe 14 states have petitioned the Congress to have a constitutional amendment, actually a constitutional convention. I'm sure the Congress doesn't want that to happen, but a constitutional amendment to address the shortcomings in, in the Citizens United case. That people now realize that if we're going to bring our democracy back, progressive, conservative, that we really need, and this is where conservatives and progressives can get together, that we really need to put pressure to have a constitutional amendment. And I think people now are petitioning and petitioning as those states go to 16, 20, 24, it's going to happen. And unfortunately in our state, our, the legislature has not yet formally done that. And I would think if people really want to have, um, to do something in a very small way, Say to your state senators, say to your state representatives, we want New Hampshire, which has been in the forefront of a lot of leading issues throughout the last century, couple of centuries. We, in terms of what we've had leadership uh, positions on, on states, we don't want to be one of the last states saying we want Congress to do something. We should be one of the, one of the first states. One of, we want to be the 15th or 16th state saying, you know what, um, the, the uh, election laws and how money is spent in campaigns is not working. When, when you look, I mentioned the last gubernatorial election, 20, 25 million, 20 million spent by outside groups. Look at the presidential election, something like $6 billion was spent, and a lot of that was from in entities called um, social welfare agencies, 501c4, very technical area of the tax code. What that really means is we don't know who's writing <laughs> yeah, the checks. Exactly. We need to know who's writing those checks. Right. And in my opinion, corporations are not individuals for the sake of um, advancing our, our, our political system. Mark, I'm going to have to end on that um, note. And I, I, if you ever want to come back, I'd love to have you, really. Thanks for having me on. Really. And I, I, I know I'm a novice at this particular end of, you know, this, this is a complicated issue. And I'm just trying to wrap my brain around it. Thanks for having the discussion. I think it's, it's helpful to get the word out. Yeah. Hey, listen, thanks for watching Speak Up, and if, you, uh, if, you know, if you've been a victim of FRM or if you want to know more about it, contact me uh, at centerforredress.gmail.com. Uh, thanks for watching the show.